I very seldom get a, an opportunity to thank all of you for the support and the inspiration to keep doing what we're doing. Believe it or not, I'm in my 46th year of working with the school here. And every year we've been supported by this eldership, backed by the members here, and we're so grateful for that. So we thank you today. I'm in my 59th year of preaching. My first sermon I preached October 1965. From of all books, Revelation. Now you know how stupid your preacher is here. You probably won't get anything out of this lesson if that's the case. But uh, I learned better since then, I hope. But we're grateful for all of your help and your support. I'm grateful to work with the men with whom I do work. In fact, every one of them was my student except for the director. So, uh, and he knows a whole lot anyway. So. You know what Brother Hearn used to tell us, Brother Greg? He'd say, I've taught you everything I know and I still don't know, we st you still don't know anything. And I thought, that's really a reflection on Brother Hearn, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's uh, think about the Great Commission for a moment, Matthew 28. Jesus said unto them, go and teach all nations, literally make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching them all things whatsoever I've taught you. And then the end of it, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He knows us and knew his people so well that he knew that there are times in life when you feel all alone, or maybe you are all alone, and he knew that. Loneliness occurs in all ages. It occurs in everyone's life eventually. Everyone faces it at one time or another. And so when you read the text of the Great Commission, pay a little bit of attention to the end. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The definition here needs to be given because I don't want us to misunderstand what I'm talking about this afternoon. Definition, a feeling of personal isolation in a busy world. A feeling of isolation in a busy world. You can be alone and not be lonely. So I don't want us to misunderstand. But you can be surrounded and feel alone. That's what we're talking about. And I wonder if you've ever experienced that. And first of all, is there a need? I think there is from the following thoughts. In social media today, guess what people are putting on there? Karen told me that people put on the social media pictures of what they had for breakfast or lunch or dinner. What's the problem? They have no connection. They're trying to make one. Lonely. Look at what I had for dinner. I, uh, uh, she told me about one. The fellow wrote, I'm calling in about the weather. I do know that people call that phone number so they can hear another voice, human, humanly speaking. Loneliness. One fellow wrote, I'm sitting here watching the ball game. Well, okay. He's lonely. They need a connection, folks that write that kind of thing. Look at modern commercials, especially beer commercials. Boy, there are all your command, com companions having a great time. Doesn't get any better than this, John. Now they show all that to show you, you need a group around or you're going to be lonely. Got to have some beer. They don't show the vomiting afterwards, but they've escaped that part of the commercial, I suppose. I know something else psychologically. People join gangs because they don't have anyone else. It's the family. It's their connection. Loneliness? The American Council of Life Insurance did a study recently. Listen to this. And as I say this, I'm thinking about all those young people who are now in Mexico. 
And incidentally, one half got there all right. The other half still stuck in Mexico City will get there tonight. But they're going to get there. But half of them are already there safely. I saw that picture today. Mary Elliott showed it to me. But listen to the largest group in the American Council of Life Insurance Study that's lonely. College students, number one. The highest lonely group, young people. Then the divorced, or next. Then a welfare recipient would be third on their study. Single moms, fourth. Housewives, fifth. Housewives? Don't they have a husband? Huh. Kevin, maybe we better teach on the home a little more. Something's missing for that housewife. Must be the husband. Must be a married bachelor, evidently. And then the last on the list, the elderly. There's a fellow who comes on 640 every day. His name is Charles Swindoll. He's an evangelical kind of a preacher, Calvinistic through and through. But he made this comment the other day about a Kansas newspaper ad. Listen to this one. You three people don't think people are lonely? Listen to this ad. You were allowed to, for $5, uh, arrange to talk to somebody for 30 minutes who would listen to you. You don't think loneliness is a problem? I think there's a need. I think there's a severe need. Somebody tell me why reality television is so popular. I'll tell you why I think it is. You, be, you become to feel as that you're part of that family or part of that group or part of that element. Makes you feel less lonely. Well, I'm in there with them. They're doing what that is. And oh, how about our songs, fellows and girls? Only the lonely. What was Hank Williams? Uh, best song? I'm so lonesome I could what? Cry. Are you lonesome tonight, Steve? Song, right? Songs about loneliness. Why? I don't know any of the modern ones because I don't listen to that stuff anymore. But we just sang where no one stands alone. Why? Why did the songwriter write that? He knew. I'm going to read you a poem here. I don't know who even know who wrote it. Loneliness is like a piano without keys, like a violin without strings, like a sanctuary without a congregation, or a choir where no one sings. Loneliness is like a blade of grass growing through a crack of cement. Loneliness is like a campground without a single tent. Loneliness is like a mockingbird that cannot sing a song. Loneliness is a feeling that one does not belong. Lonely, like a pansy in a cornfield, hidden where no one can see, I know all there is to know about loneliness because it lives inside of me. Let me give you some reasons for loneliness. I listed them up here alliter alliter alliteratedly by A's, but there probably are others. But the first one I have up here comes from Psalm 3811, if you'll look there. Look at the psalmist statement here. It's amazing what he wrote. One of the translations says, My lovers... King James. Most of them say my loved ones. Same thing. And my friends stand aloof from me. And my kinsmen stand afar off. Nobody cared about him, he said. He's all alone. No one paid attention to his sore, his suffering. No one knew what he was experiencing. Brother Clark had me speak, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, when by earthly friends forsaken. One of Joe Baxter's favorite songs was, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. But there's a line in that song, oftentimes I'm forsaken, I'm weary and sad. 
when it seems that all of my friends have all gone, this feeling of loneliness, of, of being different, isolated, everybody writes about it, everybody knows about it. I think probably you and I have experienced it. After Ernie Essery's wife died, Brother Essery was a member of Knight Arnold with us. About well, three months after Ernie's wife died, I said to him one day, Ernie, you seem to be doing somewhat better. I'll never forget his answer. Oh, man. He said, yes, Keith, but you don't see me at night. Abandonment causes this feeling of isolation all alone. Arrogance can do this to us. Self-righteousness can make you feel like there's nobody good enough, so you talk to yourself, you know. You know that old joke, I talk to myself so I get good answers. It's kind of an arrogant joke, but I've heard it said. You get to the point where nobody around you is worth anything. I'm different, I'm, I'm better, whatever it is. But self-righteousness can lead to this problem of loneliness. That's why God doesn't want us to be like that. I'm with you always. He wants to be our friend, but here we're, here's this person who's so self-righteous, he won't even take the Lord for his friend. He's all alone. He's isolated. Nobody can do it better than he can. After all, if I don't do the job, it won't get done right, right? What about ambition? How many of you know who Janis Joplin was? Remember the singer? She died at 26. You know what she said one time? I'm always lonely unless I'm on the stage. You remember what her song was? Her favorite? I got them old cosmic blues, mama. Her solution was drugs to her loneliness. Now you would think that a person that is that popular would never feel lonely. She did. Did you ever ask yourself why Elvis used drugs? There is one alone without compare, com there is one alone without companions. He has neither son nor brother. Yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches, but he never asks, for whom do I toll and deprive myself of good? This is emptiness and a grave misfortune. I just anglicized for you Solomon's statement about vanity. Apprehension can lead. Look at Micah 7.5. You wouldn't think this kind of a statement would be in Scripture, but it is. Micah said, trust you not in a friend. Don't ever trust a friend. Why? Put you no confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lies in your bosom. Don't tell her anything either. Can't trust her. You see, I'm living a life where I can't trust anyone. Well, I'm going to be all alone. 3,000 years ago, and Micah said, don't trust your wife. He's alienated from his own wife. I can't trust anyone. Well, that's a le reason for loneliness. And finally on my list here, alienation. Brother Greg, what's the last thing they asked for when you visited a doctor last? What's your name? No, you know what they asked? What's your birth date? They alienate me right there at the counter. What's your birth date? Uh, what if you forget? Are you nothing but a birthday? Society is alienating us now. What's your birthday? Not your name. What's your insurance number? Whenever I call about Dorothy's trust fund, the guy says, what's the contract number? I said, it's Dorothy Moser's contract. No, sir, what's the number? You don't care whose it is. Must be 50 million Dorothy Mosers, I guess. I don't know. But we're a number now, an insurance number. What's your number? What's your library card number? What's your social security number? Next thing you imagine, what's your prison number? You know, that kind of thing. I hope not. Stores. 
what's your debit card number? You have to give that now if you buy something right on the computer. I don't care what your name is. They want the billing day, billing information, and your number or your credit card. Who cares who it's going to? My name's not important anymore. I've been isolated. I'm just, well, I am somebody. I know that from the first men's business meeting which I ever attended. The men said, somebody ought to do this, and I found out who that was. I'm somebody. <laughs> so at least I'm somebody, but nobody has any. Here are the results of feeling alone, folks, even if you're somebody. Darkness. The lights are out, on, but nobody's home. It's how you feel. Dark. Who really cares? I got the blues. Does Jesus care? Why did that brother write that song? Or why did that man write that song? I don't know that he was a brother. Does Jesus care? Why would anyone ask that question? What is it inside of us that feels this darkness? You can also feel distressed. 80% of those who visit a psychiatrist, and my son were here now, he could tell you about those that visit him, but 80% of them tell him, we're lonely. That's why they go. What can he do? I'm lonely. Nobody to share this with. And then, because of that, they have a distorted view of life. Open your Bible, please, to 1 Kings 19, 14. Before you go to bed tonight, in fact, I would challenge you to read this text and read about a man named Elijah who actually told God, I'm the only one. I'm all alone here. I'm the only one standing for the truth. Nobody else is doing it. I'm the only one. His thinking was now, he's so feeling all alone that he's, his thinking is distorted. He can't even think straight. There's nobody here that's standing with me, Lord. The Lord said, there are 7,000 out here who have not bowed the knee, bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah couldn't get past this feeling of loneliness. It distorted everything he was thinking. And finally, it just defeated him. And when you're feeling lonely, you're living a defeated life. When the Master created us, when he put that man in the garden, do you remember what he said about him? It's not good. What's the rest of that? What's the rest of that? That the man should be what? Alone. He made us that way. We have to have somebody. Well, what happens if he's standing there all alone? He loses his sense of God's presence and God's care and God's goodness. He's all alone. God marched any number of animals in front of him. He said, pick one. Nothing there. I still feel alone, even though I'm around my dog, my cat, my cow, my horse. It doesn't matter. That doesn't get the job done. I'm all alone here. I'm in the middle of all of these animals and I'm all alone. I'm isolated. Something's wrong. And one of our preachers here used to say, when he made that woman, Adam said, wow. Because she complimented him. She completed him. He's, no more, he's not alone anymore. Well, how do I remove this? Let's go to John 10.10. 10. I don't know a better way to remove this feeling of isolation than to make Jesus my friend. Boy, do I recommend that. Because he's the best friend you can ever have. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry all everything to God in prayer. I don't feel alone anymore. At least very often. Because he came that I might have life. And that more abundantly. The thief tried to steal it. All of those things of ambition and apprehension and arrogance 
and all of those things that we mentioned this morning that can rob us, all of those things are not there anymore. The thief is not in my life. He is. And I would recommend to you if you're feeling lonely, the first thing is to put Jesus into your life. Put him there. Make him stand out in your life. Make him the center of the way you think. When you get up in the morning, thank you, Jesus. When you go to bed at night, thank you, Jesus. I like to sing myself to sleep. And I like to sing a song that goes something like this. I was lost, but you, know where to, you knew where to find me. I was hungry. You were bread for my soul. I was thirsty. You gave me living water. You were my shelter when I had no place to go. So sometimes I just want to praise you. Sometimes I just want to speak your name. Sometimes I just want to thank you. Without asking you for a thing, when I think of the love that you gave me, when I think of the life that was spent for me, then the tr trials of earth seem like nothing when they're compared to dark Calvary. What is about that? You said, everything I have, I owe to you, Lord. And the reason is Calvary. I love that. I love it because it says, when I have him, I'm not alone. And I want to praise him for that. I'll tell you a second thing you can do. Look on the screen there. Most of you have already done this. So I'm talking to the choir here. But put the church in your life. Run over there to Hebrews 10, 24 a moment. I know we read this to, to chastise each other for not attending, but let's put it in a different light. This assembly does something for us. He said, when you come together, you provoke one another unto love and good works. Well, we don't want to just provoke one another, but we want to provoke one another unto love and good works. And so when I'm in the assembly, I'm not alone. I've got everybody else there pulling for me, praying for me, helping me, saying, Keith, come on, you can do it. I want you to think about the Tower of Babel for a minute. Here were people arrogantly trying to reach God. They're going to build a tower, get way on top of it. So God dispersed them by changing the languages of each group. They couldn't talk to one another anymore. They lost their sense of community. He isolated those groups to get them away from each other because they had an evil purpose. But go to Pentecost now. Now you have a good purpose, and what are they doing? Speaking in tongues. Why? To bring everybody together. It's reversed. The Tower of Babel is reversed at Pentecost. Why? For a community reason. God said, I'm putting you in a church for a reason. You won't feel all alone anymore. You'll understand each other now. That's what I want. Over there at Babel, I didn't want you to understand each other. Now I do. Pentecost. Wow. Community. That's what the church is. Community. And then finally, what we talked about this morning. When I am willing to serve others, I'm never alone. Because there's always someone who has a need. The servant mentality is the essence of of Christianity. That has to be the case then in every area of life, whether I'm at my job. There must be some folks there where you work who are always complaining about what they have to do. Hmm. Go do it for them. <laughs> See what happens. Pour a little coal of fire on their heads. Servant mentality. The servant's never alone. Everybody's got dirty feet. Everybody needs some help. And so if you want to remove that loneliness feeling, there's your answer. Be a servant. Be a Christian. Be in the church. I read about a young boy named Bill. He was walking home from school with his arm filled, arms filled with various things from the school. Suddenly he tripped and fell. He dropped everything he had in his arms on the sidewalk. He dropped his books, his digital recorder, a baseball bat, a baseball glove, and two sweaters all over the place. 
Another student named David was walking behind Bill, hurried over and helped the young fellow there, his classmate, whom he really didn't know. He helped him pick up everything that Bill had dropped and helped carry all of that stuff home. They were in school together for the next three years, went through high school together. On graduation night of high school, Bill came to David and said, I need to tell you something. I just have to tell it to you. You remember that day that I was walking home and dropped everything I had in my arms? Well, yes, he said. He said, you ever wonder why I was carrying all that stuff home from school that day? I was going home to kill myself. I was so lonely and life had no meaning. I was ready to kill myself. I saved a few of my mother's sleeping pills and I was going to take them that afternoon. David, the day you picked up my books, you picked up me. Thank you. You saved my life. Be not overly anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding should keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Friends, he understands us. He really does. He knows our feelings. He knows what happens to us. And he has helped us all discover who we are. And he's helping us to be our best. I am not alone, neither are you. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. Brother Sanders wrote, be with me, God. He is, I promise you, Brother Sanders. He didn't go anywhere. And my friends, let me say something else to all of you. You, and you, and you, and you are needed here. Because I need you. And he is going to use you. You're needed. You're not alone. You're special. The best people on the face of the earth are sitting here right now. We're not alone. What was it he said to the Great Commission folks? I'm with you always. <laughs> Even to the end of the age. It doesn't take much to be his child. It takes a little bit to stay there. It takes baptism to be his child, but it's preceded by a decision to be baptized. That's called repentance in Scripture. It's also preceded by verbal confession that he is the son of the living God. He's deity. Those two requirements prior to baptism place you into the uh, area where God can take away your sins while you're being baptized. He will add you to the church. He will put you into the Christ as his child. And then he will promise you something. He'll never leave you. When you study the Old Testament and study God, he's always with those people in some of their deepest difficulties and sins. He never goes. And you're never alone when you're his child. I hope you're his child this afternoon. If not, will you come while we stand and while we sing? Days are filled.